from a personal standpoint, Dr. Dobbs was my first endocrinologist. Uh, he was diagnosed in 1996. There was little to no information on the internet, as I mentioned yesterday. Um, there, there was one website. It was the KSNA website at the time, and that was the only website. Uh, my primary care doctor didn't know anything about the condition. He knew the name of it. He knew that I was would be infertile. Uh, he knew that I needed a testosterone injection once a month. He didn't know anything else. Um, and I didn't trust him. So I, I found uh, the name of Dr. Dobbs through Dr. Ladenson. I don't know if he's still at Johns Hopkins. And uh, I was able to get in within a couple of weeks, maybe sooner. And I went to see Dr. Dobbs. And I learned all about Kleinfelter syndrome in the hour or so of my visit. Uh, she is a pioneer. She's a pioneer for all of us, for Kleinfelter syndrome, XXY, and the like. Um, I'm glad to be able to announce that she is here to give us a presentation and also to speak to the guys today. Uh, and I welcome her. Thank you. That was really very kind. I see that uh, both of us have gotten a little older oh, since 1996, and that's good. But you got to be thankful for that. Um, so, as Seth had said, my name is Adrian Dobbs. I'm an endocrinologist at Johns Hopkins, and I've been there for a long time. Um, I did my training and fellowship there and then stayed on. And um, this uh, medical condition has always been something that uh, really fascinated me. Um, Dr. Kleinfeld, I'm not sure how many of you know that, is actually from Baltimore. And when I first, first came here a long time ago, I was sitting in a, a large medical grand rounds, which is really what it was. It was 8 o'clock on a Saturday morning. And uh, whoever was Lee and there's something, Dr. McCusick, who at the, that time was running this conference. And after the conference, they he asked for questions. And all of a sudden, he points to somebody in the back. And he says, Dr. Kleinfeld, what do you think about this? And I nearly fell off my chair. I thought he was long dead. You know, people that have diseases named after them, this usually occurred, you know, in the last century, you know, I mean like 1900th century, um, because uh, at that time diseases were often named after the person who first uh, observed this in a, in a patient. Now they try not to do that, but somehow this has stopped. So anyway, he was still alive. Um, when I first started training, I guess he was about 80 then, still coming to Medical Grand Rounds. So he was really quite uh, an impressive uh, person, and he, he did pass away a few years after that. So this is a condition that I find, I um, think, really, I felt, always felt I could make a difference. You know, oftentimes you see people with diabetes, and um, it's a very chronic disease. In many ways, a physician doesn't have that much control over this. But I always found that when men came with, to me with, um, with this medical condition, that it was like I, I would make, um, they, it was just turning on a light bulb because for so long they really didn't understand what was going on. For so long they thought that they were the only one that had this problem. Um, so over the few years, you know, we've sort of had a group of us together at Hopkins that um, felt that this was an important uh, condition to sort of gain knowledge about, be able to help our patients. And you've been meeting them slowly over the today and uh, yesterday and today as well. Um, and we have a little booth here as, um, for you to stop by, and we really call it the Johns Hopkins Kleinfeld Center, uh, in which we have multiple subspecialties. It's a multidisciplinary group. I really encourage you to, if you are, um, I mean, I would say local, but you don't have to be local. We do people, we do see people from all over. We're also doing um, a study trying to understand the learning uh, disabilities, if there are any, or the cognitive function of people with this con with this condition. There's this thought that there's a learning disability, and we're not so sure because we see lots of very smart, very intelligent, and accomplished people who who uh, have uh, an XXY and. So we're not quite sure this is true, so we encourage you please to stop by um, the booth, fill out some paperwork, do some simple sort of questions, and that will help us get some data on whether or not there truly is uh, any learning processes uh, that's involved. 
So I am going to be around, unfortunately, only uh, in the morning here. I'm going to meet with the men, with the adult men now for a very informal session. Um, but I encourage you to um, contact me, even if you uh, just have some questions. Uh, Mr. Moore and I just were at the FDA um, a few weeks ago trying to support this group um, to get the kinds of uh, options that I think you really need. So uh, with that, I'll say thank you so much uh, for allowing me to be here. So we want to thank Dr. Dobbs. Yes. Dr. Dobbs is um, in the, in the uh, Baltimore Clinic, the Johns Hopkins Client Culture Center, our, our host this year. We came to Baltimore to feature their clinic and uh, are really grateful for the support we've gotten from them number of the presenters who are here today and yesterday um, are from that clinic. So uh, I now have the distinct pleasure, and for the first time ever that I know of, that a client doctor syndrome and trisomy X syndrome and XYY syndrome and XXYY syndrome conference, we have a keynote speaker who is going to raise the bar for us considerably on the experience of loss. And uh, I'd like to welcome Lori Earl, who's uh, with her daughter, the author of This Star, Will, uh, this Star Won't Go Out. Uh, Lori is the inspiration for the book the Fault in Our Stars, which became a Hollywood movie. And um, uh, I think without further ado, it's pointless for me to read all this stuff that's right in front of you, and instead get right to glory. Spoke. Um, his assistant got online, I got on the speaker and said, 
I just want you to know that our, our captain, um, after 20 years of service in the military, Air Force pilot, and now 21 years, is this is his last flight, and he's going to be retiring. And I kind of wondered if I was the only one that got a little bit nervous, and then I heard the man behind me say, I hope he likes his retirement package. <laughs> So we made it, and I've never been in a water cannon uh, salute. Anybody ever experienced a water cannon salute? The fire engines, as the as the plane passes in, shoot their water at the airplane. But we were all really happy that um, that he was happy. <laughs> so, um, I thank you. Thank you for letting me be here to speak. Um, I am. Not any different than you either. Just like Jim Moore, I run my foundation out of my laptop, out of my kitchen, um, my dining room, but not my basement. My basement, you wouldn't want to run a foundation out of that basement. But um, I, I thank Jim Moore for being willing. I'm, I'm not having met me before to invite me to speak and share with you today. For Sharon, who I've known for a number of years now, and she is one of the most lovely people ever. And I thank you, um, the audience being here um, and, and you're a big part of what I want to say this idea of community and togetherness and sharing um, our obstacles and our burdens and what we go through is, is really a big part of what I have to talk about today um, so I'm talking today about loss and about grief but I have to start with the fact that I really haven't experienced a lot of loss in not when you compare so much that goes on in our world. I have not been through a holocaust, and I have not been through a war, and we live in a generation and a time when, you know, most of our children, we get to see them grow up to adulthood. And we live in a country where our medical health care is amazing, and where we have a lot of laws to protect children that have special needs and learning disabilities. And that isn't true everywhere else. And so one of the big words that um, I want you to take away from today is this concept of perspective. You know, so often we feel like we're drowning, you know, our feet are wet and we're standing in big puddles. And if we just look around us, we'll see that, you know, other people's homes are being swept away by floods. And, and, and so perspective is really a big part. Sometimes when you're in the middle, you feel like you're drowning. But looking up and looking around, um, you know, nobody can walk very far down a pathway just by watching their feet. You have to look ahead of you. So I am talking about grief and loss. Um, you know, my beautiful son, Graham, uh, at the age of two, so in 1998, uh, Stefan was talking about 1996 diagnosis. So in 1990, 1996 is when Graham was born. 1998, um, you know, I'm, I'm a mom. Uh, I had three daughters, and so people said, oh, well, you have a son. That's why he's not talking, or that's why he's not walking yet. Or, and I, you know, there were things I was worried about. And so I said, you know what, it can't hurt. Actually, the thing I was most worried about is that Graham was tiny. He was short, he was small, he was thin-boned, um, and I went to the doctor, and when she called me, my pediatrician said, just sit down, don't look in your, don't, don't Google anything, I don't know if she said Google anything, don't look anything on the internet, don't look in your medical books, let me explain to you Graham's diagnosis, and she told me that he was 47XXY, and of course then I went to my medical books, I went to everything I looked, <laughs> and, um, and I became, of course, a student of what it meant to have Kleinfelter syndrome, what it meant to have chromosomal variations, what it meant to be an advocate for a child who had some particular needs. Um, Graham was a pretty amazing kid. It was a, an experience for me as a parent because I have had, sorry, I have to go back and forth with the glasses. I'm just at that stage in my life, so I hope it won't annoy you. But um, I have had three daughters and in, in a period of about five, six years, and my sisters both had boys. 
And I'd come over to the house and think, why do you have a lock on your fridge? Why do you have a lock on your toilet? Why do you have a lock on your, on your stair cream? Don't you just tell your child, don't get in there, and then I get ram. <laughs> and I learned that kids were different. And I don't know if I can say everything was boy versus girl, but um, oh my goodness, you know, we used to call the ram Houdini because he could not, he was little, and he couldn't keep him in his car seat. And I remember one particular occasion, sitting in our dining room, he must have been about, he never dropped, walked, he just went from scooting to running. And he thought it was a hoot to climb up on top of our dining table and dance. And he was impervious, you know, no, no hand taps did any good. <laughs> he was impervious to pain. And uh, basically, I remember saying, okay, I can do this, you know, behaviorism works. And I spent hours in that dining room, taking him down. It reminds me of now when I sprayed a cat with the water sprayer. <laughs> Just taking him down, saying no. And finally, he lost interest, and he never danced on the dining table again. But, I mean, he found other things. But he didn't do that one again. <laughs> we always said the great thing with Graham is that he, once he learns something and then he shouldn't do it, he sticks with it. Um, the problem, of course, is that then he finds something else far more interesting. And curiosity was certainly one of his earmarks. He loved animals. Here's, here's him being a, a black lab along with his, <laughs> along with his pet. Um, this is Graham at about five. And he was just so curious. I never knew. We, we had a, a time when we had to call out the plumber because the toilet had backed up. And you could see the edge of the toilet bowl sticking out that he had tied the flush down the whole toilet bowl. It wasn't until after we took out the toilet bowl that we found out that there were all kinds of other things in the toilet bowl. There were Legos and other kinds of toys. And um, he just was. Mr. Houdini and Mr. Curious kept us very, very busy. It was wonderful that we had three older sisters to kind of help. We could all be moms together. The scariest time was we uh, traveled as a family, and we, I had grown up uh, internationally. I grew up in West Africa, and we were committed, my husband and I, to giving our children an opportunity to have a culture. Since we were both teachers, we moved to Saudi Arabia in the Middle East for a period of time. We were there for three years while we were teaching. It was actually a wonderful experience for Graham because it didn't matter that he couldn't really talk really well um, because they wouldn't have necessarily understood him anyway. And they thought, of course, they all understood. The first question we got when we got to Saudi Arabia, oh, you have four children and you're American? Oh, are you Catholic? <laughs> But they immediately understood it was totally fine that we had a fourth child because, of course, we had been trying and trying to get the boy. And you don't even have a name as a woman there until you're the mother of, and you're the mother of your son. Um, so the mother of Graham. So they understood that. But one of our scariest experiences was the time he um, we went to a shopping mall. And he, he just, he could be gone in a second. He, he had to hide everywhere. Sometimes every once in a while he's delicious, but <laughs> it's, it's really hard to do that with your child. But I did travel with him with a leash one time, but he was gone. We were in a busy shopping mall in a city in Saudi Arabia with a child who really couldn't talk or even say his name very quickly. And for 45 minutes we had security hunting and we were hunting and we did try to find him. It was in the women's bathroom on the top of the toilet tank with no clothes on. So he had had a wet diaper and was upset and <laughs> so, so there are life life is full of challenges. And and you know, that's really part of what the grief is about. Because there is a grief that comes obviously from losing a child, but there are losses that are in our life that have to do with what we don't have, you know? We look at ourselves and we have poor health. We look at a child who may not have the kind of opportunities we hoped for. And there's an element of loss in that, and it's important to
to stop and recognize that and recognize that some of what we experience as we go through this journey is actually grief. Esther was our middle daughter, and she was only 18 months older than Graham, and they were best friends. When, as Graham began to learn to put words together at about age four, and was beginning to try to communicate um, more effectively, Esther was the one who, I would listen to Graham ask for something, and I wasn't sure what he said, and my husband would listen, and then we would say, Esther, what does Graham want? <laughs> she could always interpret him. So she was his very close companion and his close friend. Uh, there's one time when, uh, oh, about, actually, it's around the time of this first picture, we had, uh, Graham, Esther was putting that sunhead motion on Graham because we were in the sunshine and we were swimming and, and she got some of his eyes and he started crying and she's like, no, no, Graham, Graham, it doesn't hurt, look, look, look. So she puts him in her own eyes. And then of course she was crying and then they both came running to get help because they did discover that sometimes motion does hurt. <laughs> so a new baby brother came along in 2003 when Graham was seven, unexpected, you know, one of those things where you say to your husband, um, honey, are you ready for life to be really different again? <laughs> What's going on? I said, well, remember when you didn't go and get that operation? Yes, but <laughs> it's your fault. <laughs> so the best thing in the world for Graham was to have a little brother. So if any of you haven't tried that yet, um, have a little brother. Because he was Abraham's protector. And he could do lots and lots of things that Abraham couldn't do. And it was a wonderful, wonderful um, opportunity for him to be the, the, the grown-up brother. So we moved, uh, we moved to France. Around this time we had come back from uh, Saudi Arabia. We were in Massachusetts for a number of years. We still had that itch to do something that would make a difference. We, we went to work with a nonprofit organization in France. And we moved our small, large family with us. Um, our oldest daughter went to an American boarding school in Europe, and Esther and Evangeline, who's now 24, <laughs> the dark-haired daughter there, uh, went to straight into French immersion programs in the French school system, and Abraham went to a French uh, nursery school at age two. They called him Mr. Temerity, so I had another one to chase after. And Graham, we got a tutor for him who came with us, uh, an American girl came with us to France and, and worked with him, and then he went into a French school to do art and PE. And it was during this time that we found out that Esther had gotten sick. She started getting tired, and she had been, she was a third grader, the only girl, who climbed to a ceiling at least as high, up a rope, uh, to be, to have the privilege to write her name at the top. She was just, um, very athletic, and it was during this time that we found out that she uh, was took her into the doctor, worrying about her breathing, thinking, oh my goodness, maybe she's got tuberculosis, that's a problem in France sometimes, and we found that instead she had thyroid cancer, that it was already metastasized um, into her lungs, and so the difficulty with breathing was from the fact that she had so much fluid, a year and a half of fluid already in her lungs when it was discovered. Um, that's a loss. You know, nobody wants to hear the word cancer. But trusty internet tells me that thyroid cancer is very treatable. And radiation, radioiodine, wonderful prognosis. And so we, Esther had surgery, she had a full thyroidectomy, they removed her lymph nodes. Um, she didn't lose her vocal cords, we were so happy. And she began treatment. And so we decided, you know what, it was summertime, let's go back to the U.S., let's have a second opinion in Boston at Children's Hospital where we had lived before. And so having gone through that first eight months or so of her treatment and having hope and going to Children's Hospital and having them sit us down and say, can you stay close by because we'd like to do a far more aggressive treatment because there's no cure for your daughter's cancer. Um, 
but maybe with treatment, we, we don't know what her prognosis is. So, you deal with loss, you know, deal with grief, and you hold on to all the things that are around you, you hold on to your family, you hold on to your education, you hold on to the wonderful healthcare system, and Esther herself was such an amazing young woman. She had started writing in journals from the time she was about six or seven. She wrote stories. She was very creative. As the middle child, she got along with everybody. She was really that hub in our family, extremely close to my husband. Um, they had a real connection. And she had a real connection with Grant. Um, she made sure, even as she began to have to need to use oxygen, and eventually we had to move her bedroom downstairs because it was too much for her to go up the stairs. So we turned our dining room uh, into her bedroom. My husband built the wall and we covered it with saris and other beautiful colors that she liked. But she made sure she, she just focused on her brothers and her sisters and our family. And it's an amazing thing what perspective will do in how you deal with your obstacles that you face. And her perspective was amazing. You know, she just wanted to make a difference in the world. She wanted to know that people around her were okay, that they would be okay when she left. A lot of her writing, she talks about that. Um, she wanted to make a difference. She joined Harry Potter Alliance. Uh, Esther had a couple of passions. One was Harry Potter. She discovered, she began reading at about the age of four or five. You know, I did that hundred easy lessons. We were living in Saudi Arabia at the time. I thought, oh, I'll, t I'll, I'll start teaching her to read. And I think we got to about the 20th lesson. And by then she didn't need any more lessons. She was just reading. Um, so Harry Potter, every new book that would come out, um, she and her sister would, you know, fight over the books and, uh, and, and read. And, I don't know. If, does anybody know what that sign is over there? What's that? <laughs> Live long and prosper. Is that what it is? So it probably has many meanings. For Esther, the meaning of this, this is the nerd fighter sign. And nerd fighters are the fans who follow John Green and his brother Hank. Um, have you heard of John Green? He wrote the book The Fault in Our Stars, and that became a, a best-selling uh, movie. And the community that surrounded him, um, this was their sign, and their motto is uh, to increase uh, awesome and decrease world suck. <laughs> so uh, those were her passions. Um, and of course, the internet is an amazing place for Esther because she found there she didn't have to be the girl with cancer. Um, and in fact, it was very interesting, she learned very quickly how to edit videos because she would do her videos without her oxygen, and so she would do clips. <laughs> if you know her, you can watch, you can see when she started to get tired and has to go and take a break and have some oxygen for a while, and she'd come back and take videos. But her friends online, because she began to form a community, eventually they called themselves Catitu, um, and this community didn't know that she was, um, that she was sick. And, um, and then eventually they knew that she needed oxygen, and she would say, oh, I just have, I have this breathing thing. So until the day finally came, and she told her online friends that she did have cancer and that it was terminal and that she didn't know how long she would live. Um, so she shared her passions with Graham. There you are, Graham's learning how to do some of the uh, sign, how, how to do some of the uh, incantations for Harry Potter. Uh, with a broken arm, I think he's had three broken arms. One broken foot? I don't know. We've had a number of broken bones, which is uh, part of his medical, um, I think it's part of medical prognosis. I don't know. Is that, is that, uh, I don't know if that's affirmed or not, but I'm convinced that it's part of his, uh, his bone issues. But, um, so we were all dealing with Esther and, and all that she was going through and her condition. So let me just, so I have a video clip that I want to show to you. 
um, in just a minute that's going to, whoops, it doesn't want me to go to the next screen. No? Resume the slideshow. There we go. It's, I think it's because I touched it on the current slide. Let's see if it'll do it. No? Don't you love computers? I teach at community college, and I cannot tell you how many times you have to learn to be creative and adaptive because your computer stuff won't do what you want it to do. And every room that I go into at my school has different computer systems. It does not seem that it wants to go back to my slideshow. All right, let's close it. And the Harry Potter Alliance, uh, takes fandom of Harry Potter. Dumbledore had an army that dealt with the issues that they faced in their world. And so Harry Potter Alliance says, why don't we take story and use it to address the issues in our world today. And so it appeals to young people who um, then get involved in social issues of their day. And so even as Esther got sicker, so that she was really confined to you know, the four corners of her room in many ways. It was a big, you know, the field trips were to hospital. Um, by this time, she really wasn't going to school very much. She was mostly, she had a tutor at home. She already had plans in her mind uh, to take her GED and graduate. I kept saying, Esther, you know, you're, you're 15, I can look, because she loved to write. Um, when her school, uh, posthumously wanted to honor her for her graduation in 2013. We didn't tell them that Esther wouldn't have still been in school anyway. We, we let them honor her. But um, Esther left her cat. So the, we had, as I said, we had amazing medical care. And they actually sort of snuck in, with, with official approval, snuck in her cat into, um, into the hospital to see her there. But through Esther's efforts online, through her connection with John Green, they waged this big campaign and helped the Harry Potter Alliance um, in Esther's name or with Esther win a $250,000 grant. And um, they tried to bring Esther now to Florida so that she could be there as they received this big check from Chase Bank and from their community program. And um, we couldn't find any way to get her there quick enough. Uh, no airplanes could get us the kind of oxygen we needed by this point um, in order to get her there. But, so what they did, of course, modern technology, they did a live stream and live streamed Esther into uh, the event and then she could watch it on her computer and they could see her on um, the screen. So Esther was gaining some prominence through that, through her friendship with John. Um, John Green, who named uh, a holiday for her birthday. And our book, uh, talk, he talks about what Esther Day is. So on August 3rd, Esther was going to be turning 16. And so John and Hank, um, since 2007, have had a channel on YouTube. I think you have YouTube channels for your kids. Channel on YouTube called Vlog Brothers. And they would do vlogs to each other each week. And so they said, Esther, for your birthday, we'd really like to, you can pick whatever topic you want, and we'll make a video about that topic every year on your birthday um, in honor of you. And so it didn't take her too long. She came back and she said, well, I really want um, it to be about love and family. You know, we say I love you to our spouse, though. <laughs> we say I love you and we're in love romantically like Valentine's Day but there's so few times when we take the time to say to those other people in our life you know I love you and so, we should, and so it was the very first time online John says since he was about 12 that he had said to his brother I love you and so that's what yesterday is it's beginning to be celebrated in many places around the country it was celebrated in Australia by a number of Harry Potter Alliance chapters as well, and um, promoting this idea of the non-romantic Valentine's Day. You know, a day without any baggage, because we all have people in our lives that we can say, I love you too. So Esther got sicker. This was our last uh, family picture.
that we took together, and it has a story. My uh, oldest daughter, Abby, um, was heading off for her semester abroad in Germany. We were living in uh, Quincy, near Boston, where we moved after we came back for that second diagnosis. We wanted to be close to Children's Hospital, to Dana Farber, where Esther was doing experimental chemo. Um, some of those chemos or variations of them are now, I just saw a study recently, and one that comes out of something she was similar to what she was taking has been approved in the UK for thyroid cancer, at least in adults, um, because it messes with the communication system of the cancer cells. I don't really understand it all. I know it's a smart drug. <laughs> but, um, so we wanted to do a family picture before Abby left. And um, so at my instigation, we went to the only place we could get in, an F4, we went to J.C. Penney's and got our picture done. And my husband said to Esther, can you take off your nasal cannula for the picture? Oh, <laughs> she got she upset. Oh, um, and he got upset. And I said, but I just want you to take off the picture. She said, "This is who I am." Um, you know, we want to hide from truth sometimes and from reality, and um, it doesn't solve anything. It just masks the symptoms and masks what we're going through. So she wouldn't take off the name of Camilla. She kept it on, and uh, we had to all sort of intercede for her so that Dad would let it go. Uh, just a few weeks after Esther's 16th birthday, after the first Esther day, um, Esther passed away. It's interesting, this uh, cemetery is in the town of Medway where my husband worked um, minister, as an interim minister, when we first went back to the U.S. Um, before we moved into the house we still live in, in Quincy. And the church that we served there, that we served, uh, donated a place in the <coughs> cemetery. And so I said, um, and it comes out of this idea that we can't hide from the loss and the grief. Um, and I said, why don't we all go? there were several spots there and we said Esther you can pick out the spot where you want to be and we did it was a field trip to the cemetery our whole family went um, Esther was in a wheelchair and her sister pushed her around the pathways that she they pointed out you know the trees and the kinds of granite that were represented and Esther of course picked the most expensive <laughs> in the uh, red granite, <laughs> um, and she liked the spot because it was under a big, big, beautiful chestnut tree. We waited until the caretaker in the, it's a very small cemetery, until he was around the corner, and she carved an E in the tree, which we would later went back and helped make the second E for Esther Earl. Um, but she carved the first one. And I did that out of, um, well, I think I was mostly being selfish. I wanted to go to the cemetery, and I wanted to remember Esther there, alive. And that is how I think of her when I'm there. Um, <clears throat> Esther writes um, about Oh, I was going to show this next. All right, I will show this next, and then I want to share some of her writing. So, um, John's, John, John Green had become friends with Esther. They communicated quite a bit. It was mostly an online friendship. He became friends with her friends online. They became uh, symbolic of his gigantic fan base. He now has millions and millions of, um, of fans. But... They, um, uh, I'm not sure if this is going to work. <laughs> so they, what happened is his book, in his frustration and um, John 
had been writing for many years. He had worked as a, a chaplain for a short time as an internship in a children's hospital, and he always wanted to write a book about kids with cancer. And he couldn't get his story to work. And after knowing Esther, after her death, in his grief and in his pain, he threw away the book he had been working on, and he says that he wrote this story that he became called My Stars, um, inspired by his friendship with Esther in about three, three months or so um, as he worked on that story. It's not Esther's story, it's a novel. We often get asked, does Esther have an Augustus water or something? No, she talks about wanting to kiss a boy in her journals, um, and you can read about it if you pick up one of her, one of her, uh, her, her books. But um, it is not her story. Her story is a little different. But the media discovered us after John, the movie of the Fall of Our Stars came out. And of course, they're always looking for that personal connection and love to have that connection that's sort of true to life. This is where we are. So Esther um, wrote a, I, I told you she wrote journals a lot. She knew we were collecting her journals and her writings. Um, she and her dad talked about it a lot. My husband told her, Esther, you write my story if I predecease you and I'll write your story if, uh, if you die before me. And so she kind of knew that we were going to be writing about her and that we would take some of her writing. So when people accuse us of, of doing it without permission, it's not really quite true. <laughs> Although our two daughters did tell each other they made a pact that if anything happened to either one of them, the other would burn her diaries <laughs> just in case. <laughs> So, um, so this book of Esther's, uh, we call it Esther's book, although it has my name and my husband's name on it as well, is her journals primarily from the last two years of her life, from the time she's 14 to 16, but it's interspersed with um, photos and introductions by John Green and writings. My husband and I were keeping blogs. Maybe you've ever done a Caring Bridge or read one. And so a lot of those are, are interspersed in here along with her writings and then at the end is some of her fiction that was unfinished. But um, before this book was published, but about a year and a half after Esther had died, um, my husband texted me because he knew I was in the meeting. He said, don't look at your phone. So of course I looked at my phone. All right, excellent. So of course, um, we can do it off the main screen if you want. It's easier to do too many. So we got an email um, from Esther, written when she was 14. And it was written on a, a software program called uh, Future Me. She had written a letter to her 17 year old self. Um, but she says uh, that she, she sent it to us just in case and to our email. And so in her letter, which is pages and pages long, she goes through all of her siblings. I wonder how you're doing. She says, Esther, you know, how are you doing? Are you remembering to um, read? Are you remembering to be happy? And I just want to read a little bit from what she says here. She says, how's your mental state? Are you still as confused as ever? Are you talking to God again? Esther, God has been with you through everything you've gone through. He really loves you when you need him. In the present, you're ignoring him, and I hate that. How do you think you made it through that radiation when everyone thought you were going to die during the night? Do you even remember this stuff? On Thursday, I'm going to get another CT scan and PET scan, and it will show how I'm reacting to the chemo. I really hope that my lungs are improving. I'm nervous. I've been feeling a little worse with my breathing lately, and I just hope and pray that it will be all right. Hey, remember to thank your doctors. Dr. Smith and Annette, they're fantastic people, and they're your doctors. Don't be afraid to tell them your worries. To be honest, I'm not even sure if future me will even be alive, and for that reason I'm sending this email to mom and dad, since if I'm not alive, at least I know this email will be checked. Oh man, what a way to end this letter. Okay, future me, just try to be happy. Try to do things. Don't forget that many times you thought you'd never make it through the night. Remember all the people that have helped you in the past. Tell your family how much you love them. Go to school. It may seem stupid, but doing homework and research can get your mind off the little bothersome things. Read. You're forgetting to read as much, and reading is a lovely thing. Try to solve a Rubik's cube again. You solved your first one yesterday. 
Just be happy. And if you can't be happy, do things that make you happy. Or do nothing with people that make you happy. And our last paragraph says, there was so much more I wanted to say. And maybe I'll send another one of these if anything happens. I love you. And I hope you turn out good. You know, one of the questions we get asked most often um, at events is uh, the question, how are kids doing? And, um, you know, Graham, I think you got a little confused with Esther's passions there. One of those was Harry Potter. I think you got a little mixed up with Voldemort. And because he, he kind of took this idea that he couldn't say Esther's name. So she was the one that we don't say the name of. Um, and for several years, he just he wouldn't say Esther. And later on, um, well, I think I took the bookmark out and put it in another spot. <laughs> but Graham did write uh, a poem, which is actually included in this book. So that now I just lost the place. So I took out my bookmark. And, uh, and, he, and he's, he, he kept up with the passions. Esther always watched Doctor Who with him. And my husband took to over that role, uh, Graham um, has always had trouble with words. Words have never been easy for him. And yet, he loves words. His favorite activity now is writing stories, which he sends to us about every week. Sometimes they're in script form, and so we take part, and we all read our part in our stories, which are usually sort of some combination of Doctor Who and Harry Potter and other things. But he wrote this poem for Esther in 2013. And Esther means star, which is why we named um, our foundation the Star Won't Go Out. Star, when I first saw you, I knew you were the right sister for me. Your heart reminds me of you because you are so sweet and thoughtful to me. You were always there for me when I needed you the most, and you never gave up on me. Dear, if you are dead or alive, I will still love you, no matter what. So when we talk about grief and loss, which I said I haven't had a huge share of, I've had my share, as you've had your share. Um, but there's a writing, a book by uh, Robert Romanis Romanison, called Soul and Grief. I haven't read the whole book, but in it he talks about depression. And he says that depression is a cultural symptom that masks our fear of the grieving process. He, he comments that the deep wisdom of the soul knows that life is about loving in the face of loss. If any of you have watched the movie The Fault in Our Stars, my favorite scene in the movie, um, as a parent, is when uh, Hazel's mom finally tells Hazel, Hazel's just so worried, she's like, what's going to happen to you if I go? What's going to happen to you if I die? And Hazel's mom finally says, um, tells her that she's been studying to be a social worker. Oh, sorry, spoiler. You haven't watched it, forget about that. And so, Hazel's <laughs> mom says to her, um, she, she's afraid to tell her, because she doesn't want her to know. It's such a tension, you know, that balance between living the life that we have and planning for the future, you know, if, if you have somebody who's terminally ill, you don't want to talk about the future because then, of course, you're talking about it without that person. And so Hazel's mom um, hadn't told her anything about it. And Hazel is so happy because to her it proves that her mom's going to be okay, that her mom's going to deal with her, her death if it happens. Um, and Hazel's mom says to her, Hazel, you know, of course I'm going to be okay. And she says, you and I should know that it's possible to live And that's what life is. Life has a lot of pain in it. We start out a baby with pain, and we, you know, the, the baby born into this world of pain, and we, we, we want to run away from pain. But pain is part of the process of life. It's part of what lets us know that we're living and breathing and moving and doing. And Esther understood that. You know, she understood that the pain was part of life and that she couldn't really be who she was without the cancer that had made her who she was. 
and she has one video of hers on her YouTube channel where she talks about that. It's called Feelings. Um, so I love that. It's my favorite part where, she, where Hazel's mom says that, that you, of all people, should know that it's possible to live with pain. There's another uh, author, Hilary Hart. She uh, well, writes about philosophy and grief. And she has a comment where she says, we need to know that pushing away the emotional reality of grief is not helpful. It's a form of denial. It's, so is the idea that I'm going to keep my grief private and I'm going to try to move on. And you all have really made the first step in facing your grief and dealing with your grief. Or maybe it's a 20th step or a thousandth step for you just by being here in community with each other. Because um, the grief that we might go through, um, that's all right. We'll just not worry about the video clips. Or <laughs> so the grief that we might go through um, is helped by sharing in community sharing with each other. Uh, there's a lot written about what happens in public tragedy. You know, when you get something like uh, 2013 with the towers in 2001, or the marathon bombing, and, and the coming together of shared grief that helps us process that. And so I commend you, and um, along with Esther, um, I, I reiterate that phrase that says, you know, that this is good, and, and I hope you turn out good. Like she turned out. Never underestimate the power of a story about taking a chance in the time you have. It is a love story, no special effects. It's a, it's a blockbuster earning $48 million, and Tom Cruise and his alien attacks earned just $29 million. ABC's John Donvan now tells us about a message that may live forever. <laughs> It's inspiration that sold out the theaters this weekend. The girl in the movie. Why are you staring at me? Because you're beautiful. Hazel, who laughed and loved and lived with cancer. This diagnosis is Oh, okay. I uh, hear cancer story. You're a real story. Came from John Green's bestseller, The Fault in Our Stars, which had its own inspiration. Someone named Esther Earl, who was not Hazel, because Esther was real. She was a little girl in the 1990s, and then she grew. And then she got sick with cancer. This has a lot more shape to it. She met John Green when he was already a famous author, and she was a fan. Esther was an amazing kid. She was astonishingly empathetic. She was really thoughtful. She was very funny. He says it was that spirit in Esther that inspired him to invent Hazel and her insight. The wonderful life, and to know it might not happen, what do you say to that? Esther's videos made her a minor celebrity online. So not always a and I'm not always awesome, and I'm not always strong, and I'm not always great. And you guys should know that. John says, you know, that's your time that a short life can be a good life, a meaningful life. And he's absolutely right. It was short. Esther died almost four years ago at 16, never seeing what she inspired this. I fell in love with him the way he fell asleep. A movie her mom told us she would have loved. This kid, this young woman, who did not get to go past young. John Donovan, ABC News, Washington. And I just want to end with a quick uh, video. This one will open, let's see. <laughs> uh, Graham telling us we got to be involved with a collaborative about Esther Day recently and um, with a project called the Family Dinner Project. And the Family Dinner Project is all about uh, all of the good things that come out of sharing um, I don't know if I'm going to be able to hear this, no? All the good things that come out of um, eating together as a family, which we used to do a lot more of than we do these days, but we try. Um, and in this video, Graham was asked the question, what is family? So we'll see if we can... Yes, the one thing that uh, they put in the marking is teamwork.
coffee break, which you're probably already, um, but I will also be at a table out in the hallway, and I'd be happy to, to speak to you individually. Um, folks, for this Q&A session, please raise your hand nice and high so that I can see you and run the mic to you, um, so that everybody else in the room can hear you, our keynote speaker can hear you, and the camera can hear you. Okay, so hands up if you want to ask a question. So the foundation, which you're welcome to pick up a bracelet outside, is This Star Won't Go Out. Uh, these bracelets I particularly love because they were made by one of Esther's IRL friends, in real life friends, um, from grade school who came to her Make-A-Wish um, with these bracelets. So Esther wore them, all of her friends wore them, John Green wore them. When he wore them on his video, people wanted to wear them too. And so money started coming in. Um, for bracelets, and when Esther passed away, that turned into a foundation. So we've given away about $250,000 so far to help families that have a child with cancer. Usually, you know, when you're in the hospital and you're there for some weeks and you're worrying about your child's health, and instead you're sitting there worrying about how you're going to pay your rent because you're missing work. Um, so, so our our gifts are usually an amount to pay a month's rent for them who work that mortgage or utility bills, things like that. So um, we've helped about 170 families so far. Bookstore, which is a local independent bookstore here in Baltimore, um, has graciously agreed to donate 10% of the proceeds uh, to the Access uh, Conference.